the 12th, I was born on, yeah, I'm going home. I was born on Columbus Day. So we used to always celebrate Columbus Day, even though we're not even close to Italian. <laughs> what am I saying? Oh, I'm 70 years old. As people age, they seem to have a steady decline in brain size. And I already had a small head. Um, as I told you, when I joined the Air Force, uh, I had the smallest, I had to wear the smallest hat they had because my head's so small, six and seven eighths. They used to tease me and say, oh, you know, if your, hat, your head was any smaller, we, we'd have to kick you out of the service. Ah, which that, that's really funny. Ah, as you can imagine, that's really funny. Okay. Not, not true either. Come on. You, you went in voluntarily, right? Yeah. Well, you, yeah. So the Air Force at that time was <laughs> yeah, <I> had <laughs> Was the Air Force, was it still under the Air Corps? No, 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 it's still. The Air, Force, Air Force. the Air Force became the Air Force in 1948. Okay. The year before I was born. On September 18th, my daughter's birthday, September 18th. Anyway, okay, so your, your brain starts to decline in size. It, gets, it starts to shrink. Uh, it starts. It can start as early as the 30s. It all depends on how much you use it. Use it or lose it is the way it works. Uh, so if you're one of those potheads that just doesn't do anything all day long, you just kind of sit around and dude, you know, talk to people like they were all drunk. Uh, then your brain's going to start uh, decreasing in size. Um, it, it starts to accelerate about age 45, so as long as you're under the age of 45, you're okay. Uh, the degree of decline seems to vary from one individual to the next. What the hell's going on? From one individual to the next, oh, so it's back up again. Um, some people, they don't have hardly any decline at all. Other individuals, it just accelerates, and of course, it all depends on how much you're using your brain. How much you're thinking? Going to school is a great idea for people in their 30s and 40s because it, it forces their, them to think. And when they think, of course, uh, uh, it uh, slows down the uh, decline of their brain or the, the shrinkage of their brain. Brain expansion seems to continue uh, throughout your, your life. Uh, as I told you, my mother was doing crossword puzzles and, and at 97 people were calling her up on the phone and answer, asking her questions because she was the only one that knew the answers to these crazy crossword puzzles questions. <laughs> As people enter their fifth decade, their hippocampal formation begins to shrink. In other words, uh, your hippocampus has to do with, uh, with your uh, memory. Uh, so it starts to shrink. We start having a little trouble there. Potentially, you start, should start having, I uh, can't remember words, that kind of stuff happens in your, in your uh, uh, 50, or in your 40s and 50s. Uh, the supratemporal gyrus also loses volume, and this all also has to do with your memory. In fact, most areas of the brain begin to lose volume. Uh, you're either, you either use it or lose it. Oh, I know. I'll put this thing up there. So, like, when I stay up late at night and do, like, uh, word puzzles, that's good? That's good, that's good for you. Good job. Keep it, keep it up. What if you're on Facebook? Do you go read it? Facebook, uh, it's kind of a passive thinking. Okay. Uh, I don't listen to it. That's, that's cool. How about like TV shows, like game shows? Uh, game shows where you have to where like you have Jeopardy. To come up. Jeopardy's not a bad one. And that's one of the reasons why Jeopardy is so popular. Well, Wheel of Fortune. Uh, Wheel of Fortune, probably, well, yeah, I guess so. You have to figure out what that clue is. Over 4 million Americans suffer from Alzheimer's disease. Most of them decided that it was, they, they wanted to just sit and watch television all day long. Oddly, the possibility of developing symptoms of Alzheimer's disease increases with age until you re reach the age of 85. If you haven't started having memory problems at 85, you're never going to have memory problems. That's the way it works. This is one of the reasons why we see people in their 90s and, and hundreds uh, who are so lucid, who are able to just they, they seem like a 70-year-old or a 60-year-old. How about, like, in cases of, like, people that are, like, the, the military service, does that really affect the memory as well? Yeah, well, they're all that trauma. 
the trauma. Uh, the okay. more stress you're under, uh, potentially the greater the shrink shrinkage. So that's a potential problem as well. Uh, depending on what your job was. Uh, if you look at, uh, if you're watching the news right now, uh, uh, Trump had a lot of generals in his cabinet uh, and, and, he, and he fired them all <clears throat> or they quit. Uh, well, they're on television again. They're on television complaining about Trump. Uh, and these guys are in their, in their 60s and 70s and 80s. Some of these guys are in their 80s. Clapper's an old admiral uh, and he's on television all the time. He's in his 80s. So these are fairly functional individuals uh, who have, um, you know, they, when they were in the military, they had the fin their finger on the button, of course, you know, nuclear button. And now that, uh, and, and when they retired, they just kind of drifted into really important jobs. Mm -hmm. And they have been able to maintain themselves for an extended length of time. Uh, McMaster and, and Clapper and all of these, uh, all of these individuals who were, are, uh, are military people. Of course, they were officers. Mm -hmm. uh, if we're talking about enlisted personnel, enlisted personnel worry about their, their uh, the men underneath them, their, their, their subordinates. I don't know what's going on with this thing today. Alzheimer's disease starts as a memory loss but progresses into greater and greater cognitive function uh, decline until the individual can no longer carry on a conversation. Alzheimer's is accompanied by marked cortical atrophy especially in the frontal, temporal, and parietal areas, and for that reason, uh, your frontal is the thinking portion, the temporal is your hearing portion, and the parietal area has to do with movement. So eventually they cannot move. Eventually they just kind of curl up and die. Yes. So does their face look like they've been in a stroke? Or does it just... No, it's just a memory problem. It's just things start going away, and, and, they, they, never come, and they never come back. It just never comes. I had an aunt with Alzheimer's disease. Um, she was um, she was tall and slender, and she was a beauty of the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, and because of this, of course, she just kind of sat around and looked pretty. Uh, and when she made it into her 60s, she started developing. She never did anything. She never watched television. She never read. She just kind of sat there and looked good. You know, it's one of those kind of deals. That's, Hey. I know, I know. She didn't have the stimulation? No stimulation whatsoever. And so she, in her 60s, she started losing it. And uh, so for the next 20 years of her life, uh, she just kind of, her brain just shrunk more and more and more and more until she finally died. She choked to death, of course, because she forgot to breathe or she forgot to swallow or something. Is there a, like a, a certain age, if you don't, if you make it past that age, you're yeah. good to go. Yeah. 85 is, is what we've discovered. But uh, if somebody hasn't, if something hasn't happened to them by their middle 70s, usually they're good to go. You don't really have to worry about it. Uh, if you're going to develop Alzheimer's disease, you usually develop it a little bit earlier than that, mm -hmm. like, seven, like 70, my, like, my age. Uh, like we talked about, you know, the TBI stuff. Right. Like, what's the... How can you, um, well, at least it's zinc and vitamin C, right? That'll right. combat it? Right. For like how long? Or it's just, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, right? Yeah, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But the thing about, uh, about TBI, you need to keep fighting it. You need to keep fighting the fact that there's, there's damage in your, in, your, in your brain. And you're doing that by taking the zinc and the, and the vitamin C. You're doing that by taking classes. This is all really good for you because it creates new connections in your brain, and we need to keep continue doing that. Uh, the guys that uh, are the ones that, that die young and that suffer the most are the ones that sit down and start and and get drunk every night because they can't handle it. They're the ones that are going to be dead in in their fifties or sixties. <clears throat> to be able to live there, they probably do. I, they probably do, but there's not a whole lot you can do. I mean, you can, uh, people come in, and uh, I, I was thinking about when you're talking to that lady, was that the VA you were talking no, about? No, it was my freaking, uh, my, I don't know, because I had to give, I had to give my mom, you know, some money. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was like, well, I can't make it. Sometimes I make payments twice in a month. I've never been late, ever. 
Yeah. I've had a car for like a year. Yeah. So we'll, we'll just move your date. Then the 10 day grade period went on. What was I going to say? Oh, I was just thinking, you know, there's all these guys with, with uh, TBI and, and uh, anger issues, and, and they're all dealing with the VA. I can imagine getting telephone. The people uh, at the VA taking the telephone calls from angry veterans, my God, they must get yelled at. But see, when, when they find out you have a heart, mm -hmm. they totally treat you totally freaking different. Yeah. But it's crazy, like, guys that are about to, like, commit suicide and stuff. Mm -hmm. They would go by the back burner. But a guy that took something off from a truck and his finger smashed all oh, right away. Alright. It's like, what the fuck? Why is that? Because it's visible, they can see it. Well, if they if they lose the guy that commits suicide, then that's one more person they don't have to pay for. It's all it has to do with money. Even the vets. It just crazy, yeah. man. It just have these people that work at the VA don't even know what the hell we've been through. Or, or there are other veterans that, that have been through the same stuff, and, and they're, they're just as screwed up as, as anybody else is. And sometimes you get the guys that are like, they don't know, this is bullshit, I'll be right back. And they'll go talk to their higher-ups. Right. And yes, you get something done. Right. But that's like rare. One out of ten. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tough world. Ah, I can't imagine. So with Alzheimer's, it, it can be... Um, Early on genetic? Time. Yes, yeah. Early and so onset. with that genetics, is that like a recessive trait or a dominant trait? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. It's, it's, gonna, <laughs> it's good. You're going to love it. <laughs> As brains of uh, Alzheimer's patients show degeneration in axon terminals and dendrites caused by buildup of beta amyloid forming senile plaque. And what, so what happens is the waste, the waste product accumulates and you can't get rid of it. It becomes toxic and it kills the nerves. And that's what's going on here. Amyloid precursor protein is bound by two enzymes, beta secretase and presinolin. Uh, if one of these enzymes mutates, uh, amyloid plaque builds up. So, so we've got a mutation taking place, and we're going to talk about the mutation right now. I, I have a good question. Yeah. Okay, so you said it's, uh, what's the word you said? Gen genetic. Genetic. Genetic, yeah. Or right. Could you combat it by... Doing stuff or it's no, they're, they're these guys are are gone from birth. I have a friend whose father. I know, yeah, it does suck. Uh, I have a friend whose uh, father uh, was a inventor, and he invented uh, transmissions. Uh, I don't care what kind of car you've got; you've got one of his transmissions in your car. He's he's the one that created automatic transitions and Dynaflow and all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, okay. he's rich. He would be. <laughs> in his thirties, he started slipping. In his forties, he started slipping so much that he couldn't work anymore. He died in his fifties from early onset Alzheimer's disease. My friend. Good friend of mine, uh, of course, he uh, inherited all of his, uh, see, I can't think of words, uh -oh, I must be slipping. <laughs> he had inherited all of, not only his money, but all of his... Um, his uh, work. Yeah, all of his work. Well, that's not really the word I'm looking yeah, for. Yeah, but that's, okay. <laughs> that's close enough. Trying to help you. We know, yeah, we know what's going on. Okay, yeah, so he, he inherited all that stuff. Uh, he got married, uh, and uh, he decided not to have any kids because he was afraid that in his 40s and 50s he would start slipping. He was a, a uh, elementary school teacher, despite the fact he had millions and millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars. <clears throat> uh, and he and his wife decided not to have any children because they were afraid that, that uh, he would have early onset. It's genetic, and he knew it was genetic. He would pass what was the guy's name? I was in... No, his name's Young. Y O U N G. That's his name. I met him once. He was just an amazing. I know, I'm trying to think of all like the. But I think that he knew that he was he was he was uh, slipping mm -hmm. uh, because he, he worked all the time. I mean, just constantly. Wow. Uh, didn't pay any attention to. It. He had two kids. Of course, both of them are multi-millionaires now. Uh, but uh, Andy decided that he would become a uh, teacher. He would teach elementary school. And he was a really good teacher, but in his 40s, 
he said that he felt like he was slipping, so and he knew he was he was gonna he was gonna slip into dementia. Yeah. So he he retired. He could, of course. Uh, he could have. He never had to work actually. Uh, but he retired, and 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 things slowed down. I mean, his his uh, slippage slowed down, and now he's fine. As weird as that is, so he could probably well. He didn't want to have children because he was afraid that he'd pass on the gene. His sister has had four children, and and two of them have what we're going to talk about in just a second. So they're they're going to slip into Alzheimer's disease fairly quickly. Yeah. Uh, some cells have uh, show abnormalities called neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, these are tangles of the neur uh, neurofilaments that are produced in abundance in the presence of the protein tau. It's the tau protein. So if you talk about Alzheimer's disease, you talk about neurofibrillary tangles, and we talk about the uh, protein tau. Now the protein tau has to do with uh, APOE4. Another gene mutation may allow Alzheimer's disease, APOE4, is supposed to break down the amyloid plaque, but is less efficient than the APOE2 or APOE3 versions. So we can check your genes, and we can, if you have APOE2 or 3, you're good to go. If you've got APOE4, then you are susceptible to Alzheimer's disease. And this ain't good. <clears throat> and that's what she's got. Um, it hits males more than it hits females for some reason. So that's one of the reasons why his sister thought that she was she was okay. Uh, and she is okay. It's her two... Uh, she has one daughter and one son that has APOE4. As sad as that is. How do you kind of know which one you have? Or well, we can check your genes to find out if you have APOE2 or APOE3. Uh, now, the weird part is that APO, oh, sorry, I went the wrong direction. APOE4, uh, these people tend to be a lot more intelligent than, well, not a lot more. They, they tend to be very intelligent people. So it's almost like a sacrifice. Do you want to be smart or do you want to live for a while? You know, it's one of those kinds of, do you want to die when you're, when you're 50 years old or do you want to live into your 90s? Let's toss a coin. I know, yeah, so let's toss a coin to see how smart you're going to be. So a lot of these individuals, um, and uh, uh, Robin Williams, for example, had APOE4. Um, and he started having, um, suffering from Alzheimer's disease which is the reason he committed suicide. Hmm. He didn't want to slip away slowly, you know, and slip into dementia. He just wanted to go out, uh, and he strangled himself. <clears throat> he didn't hang himself, he strangled himself. He slung a, a rope, a, a belt over the, over the door, and he, he, uh, he pressed himself forward until he passed out, and then, of course, he was already, his, his weight was already forward, and he just strangled to death. Which is not a very fun way to go, I wouldn't imagine. With both amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangles clogging the former functional neurons of the brain, the basal forebrain nuclei die, the cells that produce acetylcholine, and the memory function of the brain dies with them. And, of course, that is Alzheimer's disease, and that's the end of the chapter. I was going to show you some films, but I yeah, can't show you films on this thing for some reason. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> oh, this is driving me crazy. What is wrong with this thing today? Hello. Come on. There you go. Okay. Let's go and say, perfect. Come on. <laughs> what a day. I know. This is it pretty, just started. You know, too much fun. <laughs> uh, okay, there we go. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about the sensory uh, organs. Uh, we're going to talk about touch and pain. 
sensory receptor organs. Uh, oh my goodness gracious. I <clears throat> can't read it. It's just too tiny. I can't see it. Uh, see what's working on here. So, from uh, chapter seven. Until you graduate. Until I graduate, yes. <laughs> That's what Corey said. Damn. Trust me, I also got some guys, guys in it too. We'll get some other people in. The other people, ah, uh, see, it did it again. Come on, come on. My computer's going insane. Come on. I don't know, if, if I got offered a job out here, I don't know, because I mean, at, at, at another school, they could probably make almost twice as much. Yeah. But at the same time, like the whole thing my mother was, they had nowhere to put her for housing. If I'm not in the middle of nowhere, and there's no housing, and the money, I wouldn't do it. Me, I wouldn't do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, I don't know, dude. Well, when you interview, they don't, uh, you don't interview here. You usually interview over the telephone, so you have no, no idea what you're getting yourself into. I didn't anyway. When I interviewed, I, inter I, tell I had a telephone interview, and I was up in North Dakota at the time, <laughs> interviewing at another school. <laughs> Uh, if I had seen this place, I actually had an interview at uh, San Juan in Farmington oh, okay. the, the next week, and I, I, I took this Jones. Yeah. I don't know if I would have been happier at uh, Farmington. Probably not. Probably not. I don't know. I, I, I really decided where I'm going for my message. Okay, where are you going? Um, I'll probably do one line from San Diego State. Oh, there you go, San Diego State. I heard that their, their um, Masters of Counseling thing is ranked pretty high up there. It's pretty, pretty um, Sarah Kine used to teach in that uh, department. It's going to be an at Aztec. At San Diego State. It's a good school. Yeah, it is a good school. There we go. See, now it's working. So I'm, I'm going to go to NAU after this. NAU? To get my master's in applied sociology. Oh, wonderful. Because I want to teach. You want to teach? There you go. This is a lot of fun. I'm having a good time. <laughs> I I'm good. staying awake anyway. I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 I can't teach, man. I've got enough of that being a drill sergeant. I'm going to teach you that. But I do want to help you. And I think I'll be good at that. Uh, okay, so we're talking about the sensory receptor organs. So if you think about it, uh, when you're looking at something, we have you have sensory receptor organs that are uh, collecting information. In this case, it's light energy. Uh, if you touch something, your sensory organs are determining what it, that, what that is, what it feels like. Uh, if you're hearing something, you have sensory organs in your ears. Uh, that are get, gaining that information. Uh, if you hear something, you don't see colors. If you hear something, you don't feel anything, uh, unless you've got an earache, of course. Um, so we're getting all this information all the time, and all of our sensory organs are different. And they, what they're doing is they're taking light energy or sound waves or uh, 
pressure on your on your fingers, uh, and they're um, uh, interpreting that information into electrical signals, and that's what's going on with your sensory organs. As much fun as that is. Uh, if you've ever been around somebody who is an artist, a uh, piano player, uh, they have uh, very sensitive fingers. A uh, painter has a very sensitive uh, has a very sensitive sense of touch. Uh, they have to be fairly steady. Uh, it's really hard to have tremors and be able to play the piano unless you're playing boogie woogie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, if you're if you work on cars, uh, you need all that strength and power uh, in order to um, loosen that uh, that bolt. Uh, so the uh, your sensory organs are different. Um, one is is very delicate, and the other is not delicate. Uh, I lift weights. I lifted on Thursday. Uh, when you're lifting all that weight, putting all that pressure on your hands, you can really do a lot of damage to your hands and to your wrists and to all your muscles, to your joints if you're not careful. If you're trying to lift too much weight, uh, and of course that makes you less sensitive. Your, your, sense of touch less sensitive. Uh, I wear gloves when I lift because uh, I've seen too many people with carpal tunnel from lifting weights. <laughs> Power lifters, idiots. Uh oh, she's got something. Power lifters, that's crazy stuff. Body yeah. builders make me uh, uh, I understand that. You got something I'll just wait. Yeah, five seconds. Yeah, I'm good. It's like, it's like, look at this. Oh, that's a thousand students. Oh, that's almost a whole team. <laughs> Thanks, Irene. We'll see you later. <laughs> okay, he should be here. Yeah, he's here. I saw his car. It is. Is he upstairs? I don't think so. Uh, he'll be teaching this afternoon. Is that for me? That's me. <laughs> I've got like half the students in the school. Ah. Anyway, okay, so we're talking about sensory organ, receptor organs, and we got them all over our body, sense of touch and whatnot. A sensory system requires different receptors to discriminate among uh, forms of energy, uh, so the sense of touch is not the same thing as your, as the, uh, as your, your eyesight or your hearing or your taste or your olfactory senses. A sensory system discriminates among different intensities of stimulation. Um, I was, <laughs> the dog came up and slept with me last night, had his butt in my face, and he farted. I oh. swear, oh my God, I don't know what the hell he's been eating, but it was nasty. Uh, which is a little bit <laughs> less severe than uh, the, the uh, grilled cheese sandwich that I made. Okay, anyway, yeah, he farted right in my face. And, of course, he didn't wake up. It just passed gas. <laughs> okay, so it has to do with intensities of stimulation. A sensory system must respond in a reliable manner, of course. A sensory system must respond rapidly. A sensory system must uh, suppress extraneous information. And, of course, uh, that's what happens with our sense of smell. Normally, we don't smell things. Uh, for I mean, this, this room has an odor to it. Your books have an odor to it. Your paper, uh, potentially. My deodorant has an odor to it, but you're probably not taking in any of this stuff. Whatever you just ate, your banana, your coffee, your water, your, even your water has a flavor to it. Uh, you know, all of this stuff is, if your bag has, has a, an odor to it, uh, if you had your bag near the fire last night, then it's pro probably smells a little bit like smoke. But you're ignoring all of that. You're probably ignoring what, all, all of your odors. Your breath smells like something <clears throat> at this point. You, woke, you just woke up. Uh, you brushed your teeth, so it tastes like toothpaste. And of course, this, the odor coming out of your mouth has to do with what, whether you use Colgate or Crest or whatever, I don't know, Ultra, Ultra something. Well, that's the kind I use. I don't even remember what kind of toothpaste I use. Anyway, you're, so you suppress all this, this extraneous information. Uh, there's other noises going on. These the lights are making noise. Uh, this the there's the this is a hard floor, but uh, it's concrete and it's still settling. And it, it's not hopefully it's not settling. 
Hopefully it's still <laughs> curing. <Yeah. laughs> but it's still curing. And when cement cures, it, it has a, a sound. It, it puts off a sound because it's it's shrinking, I think. All the moisture is, is going out. That's what curing is. And the moisture goes away. Anyway, so we, we're, we're uh, suppressing all this extraneous information. Uh, stimulated sensory uh, systems detector either in the form of physical energy or chemical substances. Uh, chemical substances in your nose, the reality is that uh, there are chemicals floating through the air, and that's actually what you're smelling, smoke, for example. Is a chemical, uh, when the dog farted, uh, tiny particles of, I know, feces and whatnot, there, or the gas, the methane, it's, it's, it's methane gas. Sure. Yeah. Is it, yeah, it is methane, that's right, it is methane. The methane gas, hopefully it's not hydrogen gas, that's, that means the dog will be sick. Uh, but there, these are the chemical substances that you're smelling. You're also, if you're tasting something, if your body has to break it down into, into chemicals, and then you can taste it. Uh, if you can't break it down, then you can't taste it. If you put something in your mouth that doesn't taste like anything, it doesn't have any chemicals in it. That's why water tastes, because it has minerals in it. Yeah. If you drink uh, distilled water, it has no flavor because there's no chemicals in it. If you taste uh, water that's been sitting for a long time and all the oxygen has gone out of it, it tastes flat. And the flat is the fact it has no oxygen in it. So what we really like is water with oxygen in it. That's what we like to taste the oxygen. Uh, each sensory organ is designed to receive and transmit a specific type of stimuli to the brain. Uh, the receiving portion of the sensory organ is the receptor cell. The receptor cell converts the energy into an electrical potential, and then that, that is the information that we utilize. Uh, when a receptor cell changes the energy of its stimulus to readable electrical or chemical potential, it is called sensory transduction. Thus, the receptor cells are known as transducers. So we have uh, transducers in our optic nerve, in our olfactory system. Uh, these are all transducers. Uh, the, uh, the nerves that tell us uh, what something feels like or whether we're touching something, they are transducers. Uh, some receptor cells have axons uh, of their own, while others stimulate an associated nerve ending. The structure of a receptor determines the uh, forms of energy to which it will respond. Uh, receptor cells generate a potential is the change that must take place between the impact of the stimuli and the initiation of nerve impulses. Uh, so if you're looking at something at night, uh, if, you're, if you're looking out in the dark, uh, it has to, there has to either be movement or there has to be some, it has to put off some kind of light in order for you to detect it. If it doesn't, then you won't detect it. Uh, the problem is that if, when you first go out at night, of course, everything's really, really dark. If you sit out there for about 15 minutes, pretty soon you can see fairly well. Um, if you've ever been in an environment uh, where there is no light, like in a cave, uh, then that's true blackness. You can't see anything. Uh, you can potentially see uh, yourself. If you got a, well, there has to be some light being generated from some place. Uh, so if you go into a cave, that's true darkness. If you go outside here, even though there's, uh, the other day, or on Saturday night, uh, the electricity went off at 9 o'clock. They probably told us that they were going to turn it off. It was off for six hours. Uh, anyway, if you went outside, um, it was dark. It was really, really dark. There, were, there was no light any place except if somebody had a flashlight or a lot of people were using their phones, which I thought was funny. Uh, but, uh, it, it, you know, you're looking out and you can't see anything. But then eventually you got to the point where, yeah, the moon was, it was a half moon, so it was fairly bright. Uh, we had starlight, uh, and stars actually put off, not a lot of light, but it puts off some light so you, you can see things. Um, one of the, the Things about uh, Vietnam was the fact that uh, Vietnam has a lot of atmosphere. It's a, it's a rainforest. Uh, so it's uh, not overcast, it's just hazy all the time. 
So at night, um, you can't see the stars. You rarely can see the moon. If you can't see the moon, it's always got a, it had a halo around it. Uh, so it was really dark. I mean, it, was, it tended to be rel relatively dark. Uh, but uh, my brother has tunnel vision. Uh, he, his, his eyes are set into his, his skull. Um, and he can see really well in the dark. And he didn't have any problems wandering around in the dark. A lot of people can't see in the dark. They, they can't see very well at all. But my brother was just amazing at it. I, I have to wear glasses when I drive at night. Is that right? But I think it's from wearing NVGs for many years. It could be. It could be. Um, uh, you change the way that your eyes see. As strange as that is. Like I, 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 I can see. Like we were driving back from the Shiprock Fair last night. And like... Like, you know how the road like, kind of goes like this, but then there's like a road like that? I can't tell the difference. Oh, no. Unless I wear my glasses. <laughs> That's scary. That's scary. <laughs> that is scary. Yeah, plus Corey's there. Put your glasses on. So <laughs> You're going to kill us all. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks. That sucks. <laughs> Generator potential is represented by electrical change. Last year, uh, I was reading papers at the end of the semester, and um, I had to drive to Albuquerque. Oh, I had to go pick up my wife, and uh, so I'm driving back, and I can't. And all of a sudden, I can't. See. Well, it's not that I all of a sudden I couldn't see, but I couldn't see. You didn't eat your whole banana. I was gonna eat it, but my cup is leaking. Today's banana day. <laughs> 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 I couldn't see, and the reason I couldn't see is because when I was reading my papers, I, had, I have reading glasses. They're 150, they're not really strong. They're only 150. And I was wearing my glasses so much that I couldn't see without my glasses. It was just weird. I had, I had changed my eyesight that much uh, from reading all those papers. And I couldn't see, and I had to squint in order to, to drive down the road. And I felt like I was going blind or something. But that wasn't it at all. It was the fact that I had, had worn my glasses so much reading all these papers that I had blinded myself. It, with my, my, their prescription, mm -hmm. um, this, this one, I have bone and cartilage floating around. Okay. And this one, it's, I don't know how to explain it, hazy. Okay. That makes sense. Sure. So uh, it's like it, it's a low prescription, like. But if, if you mean if even with a prescription, the, the haze doesn't go away. Uh -huh. Okay. I just think my eyes are just. Screwed. Is this the side that you? Yeah, did? this is the side that I you got hit. Failed. Yeah, you see the scar? Well, still got my eye. I got right here. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> right here and right here. The so almost still got my eye. Much of a scar. It's not, not a very good scar. Sorry. <laughs> you look, you, I can't see the scar. <clears throat> what, uh, I want to see a, a big white mark across your face. No, it's, it's right here. Oh, yeah, right yeah. I, you can, I right can see where it is, but it's just not very prominent. They did a hell of a job when they put that. Yeah, it's I, I don't know. I yeah, that, when you pull it down, I can see it, but otherwise, I can't. I was in Germany for about four days. Maybe. Is that five? Five? Yeah. Four or five days at large tour? Well, I was pissed <laughs> off, man. I want to get back. And then they put me in the freaking one of the S shops. I was like, damn. So I ended up working in S2. You started working four di days after you came back from a TBI? No, no. I mean, I was obviously in the tent. Right. You know, and uh, I looked out from Germany. Uh, we were, I was in Balad. Which is right outside of back then. They moved you back? Yeah, just to, to, just to recuperate. And then I went back. So all together recover time was probably about four weeks. That's crazy. That's insane. My God. But it wrecks a whole different bone game. Well, sure it is. I mean, the stress <clears throat> of being there would be enough to mess you up. Why am, why am I talking about this? Okay. 
The skin contains various types of receptor cells. Uh, this is a Pacinian uh, uh, corpuscle. These, these are Ruffini's endings, um, Meisner's uh, corpuscles, Merkel's discs, uh, and of course uh, you've got free nerve endings out here as well. Of course, the hair follicles are, will tell you, give you a lot of information as well. So you've got all of these different types of touch that, that give you select pieces of information. If you were an artist, if you were, if you played the piano, I used to play the saxophone, it wasn't that big a deal. You didn't really need a, a touch uh, to be a saxophone player, but to play the piano, to play the violin, uh, to be a painter, uh, you need, these have to be very, very uh, acute. What about EOD guys? Yeah, or, or safe crackers. Yeah, EOD guys, sometimes they can feel it if, if it's about to, 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 uh, uh, to make contact. It's weird. It is strange. Those it's like are, a sixth sense. It's a no. sixth. Get the fuck out. Yeah, exactly. And, and it has to do with the touch. If they can feel something happening that they're not in control of. And that's usually what it is. And that's why if you've ever watched them uh, uh, defuse something, they've got both of their hands on different parts of the bomb and they've got her or the ordinance. Uh, they've got one hand is doing something, the other one is touching it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's like almost like a ground. Exactly. So what they're trying to do, detect is something happening inside that uh, or piece of ordinance that tells them that it's about to, to discharge. That's what they're that's what they're feeling. For. So their their hands got to be real. Oh yeah, so very delicate, very delicate, and not everybody can do it. I mean, you can. You can sign up to be uh, EOD, but you know if you, if you don't have the touch, then you can't do it. It's an art form. There was a guy like that, and he's like, "Oh, it's full security. We got this." You see, like two guys go through the suits. Yeah. <laughs> Spaceman suits. Right. Spaceman suits. <clears throat> except they take their gloves off in order to yeah. you know, to, to take the uh, the ordinance apart. There are free nerve endings in the epidermis and detect, that detect pain and temperature. Uh, there are Merkel's discs and Meissner corpuscles uh, just below the epidermis that detect touch. There are Pacinian corpuscles in the lowest level of the dermis that detect vibration. There are Ruffini's endings at the same, in the same area that detect stretching. The Pacinian corpuscles looks like a, a slice of onion. It's really kind of weird. You remember Shrek. He's, he's a, an onion that needs to be. Separated. It's my favorite movie. I love that movie. Which Does movie it is that? <laughs> what movie is that? Shrek. Oh, Shrek. Oh, yeah. Shrek. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Pacinian corpuscles are found throughout the uh, body and skin cells and muscle fibers. They detect vibration. Uh, Pacinian corpuscles are <laughs> onion shaped structures that surround the axons of afferent neurons. Vibrations uh, produce an electrical potential uh, whose level is directly proportional to the strength of the vibration. When the electrical impulse is strong enough, nerve impulse is generated. Uh, and these are Pacinian corpuscles, as you can see. It looks like a slice of uh, onion, as weird as that is. Now, when we're talking about vibrations, <clears throat> if you've ever been in an earthquake, and if you've been in San Diego, I know you've been in earthquakes. Actually, I was in... Chino Hills, when the big one in Northridge. Uh, ah. I, uh, man, I was rocking me to sleep. <laughs> You're rocking to sleep. I was like, I think I was like eight, eight when, nine. When we were in Japan, uh, we, we got hit by, by earthquakes almost every day. And what we discovered was that if we were standing up, especially if we had shoes on, even if we were barefoot, we couldn't detect the earthquake. But if we were sitting down, in a chair, and it didn't even have to be a hard chair, it could be a soft chair. You've got all these Pacinian corpuscles in your butt, and they're the ones that detected the, the earthquake. Now my, my cats, we had uh, two cats over there, uh, those cats would know that the earthquake was about to hit, and they would, they would take off. So we knew that if the cats took off, you, you, uh, nothing had happened yet. <laughs> and these cats are just running across the yard trying to stay out from under anything. Uh, but the, the cats could detect it before it happened. But of course, as humans, we're, we're not as sensitive as the cats were. Uh, so we had to be sitting down in order to detect it. Of course, you can hear it too. You can hear all the, the rattling and whatnot. But if we were standing up, we had barely could feel it at all, unless it was a really good trembler. 
really good shape. Uh, when I was working at the National Cemetery in Riverside, California, we had used, we used to have earthquakes, and uh, they were pretty good. I mean, we could feel them. You know, we were shaking back and forth. Of course, I was most of the time I was working in a uh, garage, so you could hear the doors rattling. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but if you're sitting down, you can really tell if you're having an earthquake. So evidently, our earthquake detection uh, receptors are in our butts. So mm -hmm. something to remember. Or if you're in your bed, I don't know if it'd work in your bed at all. Of course, it rocked you to Northridge. It rocked you to sleep. Yeah, I mean, at the, I was in Chino Hills, mm -hmm. and Northridge is in L.A. Right. So it's pretty distant, you know, but it, it was a big earthquake, though. That Northridge one? I used to live in Northridge. <coughs> CSUN. But, I mean, Colorado you Colorado State University, Northridge. San Andreas Fault's right there. Oh, right, yeah, it's right there. It's right off, right, right off of San Diego. But that one, the, the huge one in Frisco, mm -hmm. what, 1905, 1903? Right. Yeah. That one was huge. It took down buildings. Yeah, it just leveled the whole place. Now, the funny thing about that is that um, the um, Inca, Inca uh, would build houses to withstand earthquakes. And they make the walls pyramid, pyramidal shaped. Mm -hmm. So they weren't straight up and down. They were angled like this. So the base was, was larger than the, than the top of the, the wall. And those walls are still there, the ones that the Incas made. The ones the Spanish made, which were all flush, have all fallen down by this time. But uh, the ones the Incas made were, are still together. So they made it like almost like a, like a tent? Well, it's not that it's not that extreme. It's it's like this, and then the the Spanish would make it flat, you know, ninety degrees. But the Inca would make it like that, and those are still there. If you go to Machu Picchu, uh, you go uh, to Cusco, where the where the Inca built uh, yeah. most of their buildings. All those buildings are still there, even though they've had multiple earthquakes that have knocked down cathedrals and destroyed churches and whatnot, and destroyed buildings. All the the buildings in, in Cusco that were built by the Inca are still intact because their walls are superior to what uh, <clears throat> Europeans were making or have made throughout the years. Uh, they built a cathedral on top of uh, a, uh, a wall, an Inca wall, an Incan wall, and that wall has will dissipate the uh, the earthquake, so that cathedral is still there. Bacinian corpuscles are found throughout the body and skin and cells and muscle fibers. They detect vibration. We've talked about that. When the electrical impulse is strong enough, nerve uh, impulses are generated from the vibration. So if I run my finger across the desk, I can tell what the texture is uh, of the desk because of the vibrations that I feel. It's fairly smooth. This has bumps on it, so I can tell it's got bumps on it. Uh, the stimulus uh, occurs because a vibration deforms the corpuscle. Uh, this de deformation uh, leads to the tip of the axon being mechanically stretched. Uh, stretching the axon enlarges the pores in the membrane and al allows sodium ions to enter. Uh, when the generator potential reaches the threshold amplitude, the axon produces one or more nerve impulses. So it's sodium. Uh, so this is a problem. This can be a problem if you're dehydrated, and uh, usually if you're dehydrated, um, you're, you don't have, well, if you're dehydrated, you don't have enough. Uh, what it's, it sucks the sodium out of your system, and if it sucks the sodium out of your system, all of a sudden you're, you're not nearly as sensitive to touch as you were before because of uh, the loss of sodium. Each receptor cell encodes the stimulus uh, so that touch impulses will not register colors, and pain will not register smells, uh, but each receptor has a range of response potentials that does not encompass the sensitivity that most sensory organs detect. Multiple nerve cells acting in a parallel manner give the individual a coded picture of the intensity of the stimulus. Uh, and this is really kind of uh, the way the world works. Um, if you're touching something with your fingers, of course, you're, it has to uh, register with you as to what the uh, what what something feels like, the texture of something.
Many receptors show progressive loss of response uh, when stimulation is maintained, and this is known as adaptation. I mean, if, you're, if you rub this when you first touch it, of course it feels one way, then later you're, it's, you're not as sensitive, and that's because of adaptation. How about um, for people that are blind? Does their, their t touching sense, is it more sensitive? Yes, it is more sensitive. This is really weird. I was uh, reading a, an article last night. They were looking at individuals with a sight and people who were blind, and they were giving information to the police about uh, an incident. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the people who were blind gave them more information than people that had eyesight. Because the people that had eyesight could only react to what they saw. Yeah. But the people that were blind talked about the smells, they talked about what they heard, they talked about what they felt, um, what they smelled, you know, all of, the, all of these other senses. Yeah. So they gave them a, more, a clearer picture of what was going on. The other thing was that if they, uh, the person that has a sight, of course, was scared because they saw it and it made them scared, so they stopped responding. Mm -hmm. But the individual that was uh, blind, uh, they didn't get scared. They just started detecting something that didn't make any sense to them. Uh, and of course, they accumulated all this information. So they actually gave a better, a, a better picture of what was going on, even though they, they didn't see anything. Yeah. It was the only it was the only sense that they didn't talk about. So they actually gave better information. They're better witnesses than people with eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> Tonic receptors show little adaptation. Uh, phasic receptors show a rapid decrease in the frequency of nerve impulses. And there we go. Each sensory modality has a select pathway that it takes to its sensory area in the brain. Uh, this is known as the sensory modality sensory pathway. Uh, so uh, eyesight uh, goes to the occipital lobe. Uh, hearing goes to the temporal lobe, and of course uh, the uh, temporal lobe is right next to, to, the, uh, uh, to the sensory organ. Uh, so potentially you respond more rapidly to something you, that you hear than you do to your eyesight. Uh, eyesight, uh, for one thing, it's upside down when it gets to, into your brain and it has to flip it back over. It's, you've got a million different receptors that it has to make sense out of. Uh, but uh, hearing is almost instantaneous. Uh, each sensory neuron has a type and intensity of stimulus that will lead to its firing. This is known as the sensory neuron's receptive field. Um, uh, they tease me all the time. Uh, people tease me. I, I don't understand. You know, Patrick Blackwater. That son of a bit. No, I'm just kidding. He's a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah, yeah, he's okay. Jeremiah Marius. These guys tease me all the time. I have a really sensitive sense of smell. Mm -hmm. And so I can detect things that other people don't even think about. Uh, my receptive field for my olfactory senses are, is, is very extensive. Um, when I was working in the lab, I could identify I could identify, I could tell if a lady was pregnant just by the odor coming off of her urine. As weird as that sounds, I mean, if, if, unless you collect urines, you don't understand what I'm talking yeah. about. Okay. If you, if you got a whole rack of, of, of urine sitting here, there's an odor coming off of them, and it smells like piss. Yeah. It is piss. <laughs> okay. If they are pregnant, then they're putting off all these different hormones, these different pheromones are coming off of their urine. Uh, so I could, I could detect whether they were pregnant just by the odor coming off of their urine. Yeah. Not that I was sniffing of the urine, that's not what was going on. You weren't I'm looking a, for it. it was I wasn't just, looking for yeah. it, but I knew that if, some, if somebody in that, that stack of urine are, are pregnant, and if there was only one urine and she was pregnant, I, could, I knew that she was pregnant before we even did the test. We, I had a friend that would do blood alcohols. Uh, you do blood alcohols, you draw it in a, uh, in a gray top tube, um, <clears throat> and uh, then you, you have to pop the top in order to, to, to draw up the blood in order to run the test. And she would sniff the blood and she could tell within like 
two one hundredths of a of a milligram at how drunk that person was. I know she had that sensitive. Her nose was that sensitive. To well, I mean the odors of alcohol. Oh, with the blood. With the blood, yeah. Oh. And she's not sniffing his breath. She's sniffing his blood. You know, the alcohol gets into your blood, and of course, alcohol evaporates as soon as you, as soon as it reaches the air. So she could smell it. She could pop the top and smell the the tube. Uh, it's got loaded. <laughs> yeah, well, she would know. She'd know how drunk the person yeah, was. I mean, you get really sensitive to these kinds of things. So she knew how much alcohol he had been drinking. She knew whether he had one drink, two drinks, three drinks, whether he was drinking vodka, tequila. Corey or is, is like that. Like she'll smell, like we'll be driving, she there's a fire somewhere. Well, that is not three miles down the house. And there's, there's smoke. <laughs> so you're, some people's receptive field is very broad. Some people have very little of uh, whatsoever. Uh, the area of the brain uh, where select sensory information is received is the primary sensory cortex. Humans average between 10 to 20 square feet of skin uh, over their bodies, depending on how big they are. Uh, skin is made up of three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous tissue. The epidermis, of course, is the outer layer. Uh, it ranges in thickness. As you get older, it gets thinner. Uh, so you guys are lucky, your, your skin is relatively thick. Uh, I'm 70 years old, so my skin is relatively thin. Uh, my dad had psoriasis, and his skin was extremely uh, thin, almost as thin as tissue paper. Uh, if you grabbed a hold of him, and this happened one time, uh, if you grab a hold of him and try to pick him up, you'll tear it, you would tear his skin off. Yeah, yeah it would just fold. I've seen that before. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Nice. Can you fix yourself? Do you bleed easily? Do I bleed easily? Well, I uh, had a heart attack in 2010, so I'm on aspirin therapy, and my blood's relatively thin. So yeah, I bleed pretty, pretty easily, unfortunately, which is kind of weird. Yeah, but my mother's the same way. She has suggestive heart failure. Yeah, so she's probably on some blood thinner, and that uh, that makes her bleed fairly quickly and extensively. But the difference is, sure, I bleed really well, but I, at least I don't have blood clots in my brain. <laughs> Which is why they're giving me all of this aspirin. So your epidermis is fairly, is, it can be thick, it can be thin. Uh, it is the outer layer of your skin. Of, of your skin. Uh, it's relatively dry. Uh, it has antibacterial uh, substances uh, on it. Uh, but there are certain bacteria that can live on it, and those bacteria usually will destroy other bacteria. So they're they're the good bacteria. They're protecting us from the bad bacteria, and that's on our outer skin. The dermis is our second layer. It contains uh, the network of nerve fibers, blood vessels, and connective tissues. As you can see, it's it's relatively extensive. Uh, specialized outgrowths originate in the dermis, uh, hair feathers, claws, hooves, horns. Uh, we have hair, of course, we don't have, well, we have fingernails, and that is, uh, comes out of the dermis. Uh, the reason that your fingernails are attached as well as they are is because they're in the dermis. They come out of the dermis, and so they don't just pop out or whatever. You can pull the hair out, but if you do, it hurts because it's, you're pulling it all the way from uh, from the dermis. I know that. That's why it hurts. <clears throat> uh, what else do we know about this? If we get burned, of course. Uh, if you get a sunburn, no big deal. Uh, you just lose the, uh, the, the dermis. It's not that big, or the epidermis, I'm sorry. If it goes into the, uh, the dermis, now you got a problem because you have done damage uh, to the second layer of your skin. If it gets into your, if it's a third degree burn, it gets into your subcutaneous tissue. Now we got a really serious problem because this portion has been destroyed. It is gone. It's not there anymore. So it has to scar over. And if it scars over, of course, you don't have the same sense of, of touch, uh, a feeling. It doesn't stretch like, uh, like regular uh, epidermis does. Uh, this portion is gone. Uh, and uh, of course, now, now we have a, a real serious problem because you don't have the same sense of touch. It doesn't stretch. I had a friend that uh, when he was a baby, he burned, he pulled a, uh, what was it, green beans. 
Uh, they were cooking green beans on the, on the stove, and as a baby, he pulled it off. It spilled onto his back, and it, he had third-degree burns all over his back. Um, from time to time, he had to go into surgery so that they could... It was all scar tissue on his back. Yeah. So they had to, had to uh, go in and loosen that up. Uh, they'd make cuts and, and stretch How about um, when that happens to people that just say they cut a piece of skin from another part of their body to cover that part? Is that, is it, are they the same way with that part or is it? No, it's, uh, it, um, if, if it works, which it rarely, it doesn't always work. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll have dermis, it'll have all the feeling that it had before, oh. potentially, because it's not scar tissue. I mean, scar tissue, it, it just, it's just a covering. It's just a horny covering. A thick covering. That's why scar tissue is is harder than, than regular skin. Yeah, okay. that's what happened to my nephew. That's why it's on the side of his body. Oh, so they put on they put they took skin from his thigh. From his thigh. Up here. Okay. Yeah. So how does his, his thigh look? I've always wondered. Usually it just heals. Yeah. It's just it it it's, it's it didn't just, scar. No. Okay. That's good. Yeah, you can take usually take it off and, and replace it, but that's Relatively new and it's not always successful. Yeah. He's very lucky that, yeah. that it took. Uh, moving it from one place to, to another doesn't always work. The skin looks different. Yeah, it is, it, it is different. Yeah, because but, le leg skin and, and arm skin ain't the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But he's adjusted to it very well. Oh, he's good. Not, I think maybe because he was just young at the time, too. Right. Yeah. Uh, the lady that they had, uh, they had the first face transplant uh, about six or eight months ago. Um, she, her body has rejected the face transplant now, so oh, wow. that's interesting. Yeah, it's kind of sad, but she's looking for. So they're looking for another donor. And from those donors, they're usually from people that are dead. dead. Yeah, well, they have to be dead. Well, I'm just saying because like, I don't know. It's just something like, that like a whole face. Yeah. That's what I was thinking, like... Face-off? Just... The movie Face-off? Okay. Oh! That's got... Uh, who does it have in it? John Travolta's in it. Yeah. It's... Kind of like that, kind of. Well, kind of, I guess. Yeah, Nicolas Cage. Nicolas Cage, okay. Yeah, well... Through? Through? The whole thing? Yeah, but see... <clears throat> this was the first face, real face transplant. Yeah. And she didn't look natural at all. I mean, it was better than having no face at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, now she's rejected it. Mm, her body? Her body rejected it. I, you know, these kinds of things happen. We can, we will, I, and that's one of the reasons why taking it from the thigh and putting it on the arm, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It all depends on, I mean, we have, uh, we reject different parts all the time. Uh, that's what autoimmune diseases are. Mm -hmm. Um, so our bodies are constantly trying to figure out uh, whether something is supposed to be there or not. And yeah. sometimes it will attack itself, and that's what an autoimmune, that's a rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and all the rest of it. Yeah. Some singer has just, she has a, uh, a neurological disease, it's a series of neurological diseases that attacks her connective tissue, which is actually what lupus is. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it's ugly. It's, it's pretty bad. Uh, as our environment becomes more and more uh, complex, uh, more and more autoimmune diseases. Our bodies are taking in toxins, and uh, they're trying to, to reject those toxins. Uh, and the more toxins that they have to reject, of course, the more likely that they're going to reject their own, their own cells and whatnot. So we're seeing a lot more of that. A lot, of, a lot more autoimmune diseases. Women's immune systems are a lot stronger than men's immune systems. Women are more important than men are. Women represent babies. Men represent nothing. We represent 